Sweet. Thank you so much, uh, Jose, for inviting me. And thank you for everyone for uh, attending this conference on a topic that I really like to talk about, which is uh, uh, saying goodbye to velocity and, and replacing it with Kanban metrics. So uh, a little... Oh, boy, I just... It's all good. We have a mutiny issue. Sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Let's so, start again. <laughs> oh, no problem. Uh, uh, so, so this is me in a few, a uh, few images. I started working with Agile in 2003 uh, in Western Canada in a place called Calgary, Alberta, where we're wearing uh, cowboy hats it is quite normal on the street. And, and then I came back to Quebec City in 2009, where there wasn't a lot of Agile going on. So I started something called. Agile Tour, the Quebec City version, and we've, we've been running for about, about what, 10 years now with uh, around 1,200 participants every year uh, for Quebec City, which is a half a million people uh, in a city that's, that's pretty big. And in 2010, I decided to join Scrum.org to become a trainer. I've been a trainer with them for 10 years. Uh, I've switched jobs five times in the last 10 years, but I stick with Scrum.org as I find it's, a, it's an incredible uh, organization to improve my profession. And finally, in 2018, uh, Scrum.org added a new course, which I love to teach. And it's thanks to people like uh, Jose who've joined Scrum.org. It's called the Professional Scrum with Kanban class. So it explains how to do Scrum with Kanban bond inside of it. And, and a key part of that, that, of that class is the Kanban metrics that you will see today. So that's a little bit about my professional journey. And, and since I love, like to talk about Kanban and metrics about them, well, Jose asked me, well, won't you want to talk about them uh, at Agile London? And I said, yes, because uh, and when I now work with teams, uh, I, I realize now that velocity and story points is not something that's really fun and, and Kanban metrics are a great alternative. So to get the, the hang of this tool, which is called menti.com, I'm going to suggest or propose to everybody to go to menti.com and type in that, that number in there, that 12, 59, and 42 digits. And, and just let's, let's see if uh, uh, we can do a quick check-in by just typing in if we're, uh, we're feeling all right, we're quite happy, we're maybe just a little bit mellow, and some people are quite maybe a little bit more sad this afternoon or, or this evening in, in, in England, and if there's anybody with some, some fever issues. And as people are voting and we're kind of getting along with that tool, we can see on the bottom right the number of people who are voting. So it's quite fun to see that we've got around, uh, what, 40, 44 people who are voting. So let's see at the end of this talk if we're still going to have uh, 45 people or maybe a little, a little, a little bit less. All right, so I'll let people vote here. And, and as we're, uh, we're starting to vote, let's go to a more serious question about, um, can you folks tell me which ones are the Kanban metrics? There's actually six choices at the bottom of this, uh, of this slide. Uh, is it man days? Is it cycle time? Is it work in progress? Um, we've got also complexity in the choices. We've got throughput put story points and the work item age. So based on your experience or maybe what you've read in, in the literature or on blogs, what would be called the, the Kanban metrics? And feel free to put more than one uh, answer in there. All right. So we've got about 45 answers and, and yep, the, the crowd is all, is all correct. Uh, if I'm gonna sh reveal the right answers, it is a uh, cycle time, work in progress, throughput, and work item age. So congrats on everybody. You're, you're pretty much in line on what the Kanban metrics are. Um, usually most people will maybe forget work item age. That's my, maybe the, the, the Kanban metrics that is the, least well known. So we'll dive in a little bit later on what that is and how it can help you in your teams. But uh, congratulations to, uh, to everybody. You, you've narrowed them down pretty well. So, so let's talk about the first uh, uh, Kanban metrics. It's going to be cycle time. And, and let's compare it with your story, point, story points right now. This is something I do when I get uh, uh, to new teams. I try to compare cycle time and the actual story points on, on stories that they've completed. And I do this to see if there's any value on continuing doing those story points. 
So let me, let me show you what I mean exactly. So just before we dive into that comparison, uh, I'm just going to lay out what's my definition of a cycle time. For me, it's the amount of elapsed time between when a work item starts and when a work item finishes. And it's actually not my definition, it's the definition from the Kanban guide for Scrum team on scrum.org. And I find it's a really good definition uh, about cycle time. So in a Scrum team, I'm, I'm gonna say that my cycle time is from the ready column. So when a, a, a story goes into the ready column on my Scrum board, and goes all the way to done, that's gonna be my cycle time. So when a, a car goes into ready, I start my timer and I'm gonna record that time all the way that it takes to the done column. So that's gonna be my definition for cycle time throughout this conference. So now that I've established my definition for cycle time, I'm gonna compare this with my typical story points. And I don't know about you, but in, in, in Quebec City in Canada, story points are usually stories with one point, two, three, five, and eight. Usually in, in my sprints, these are gonna be my normal values. Sometimes I'll get a 13 or a 20, but most of the times it's gonna be one, two, three, five, and eight. And what I'm gonna do with those, with those values is I'm gonna plot uh, how many days it took for a five point story to be completed. So for in this example, we can see that a story of five point took 12 days to be completed from its time from the ready column in the sprint backlog all the way to the done column. So if I move forward one step, I would expect that I would see some kind of distribution like you are seeing right now on the screen where um, stories of five or of one points are quite small. So you'll have small cycle time with them. And as you increase your story points, you'll have stories maybe of five points, which will have a distribution that will be higher than stories that with one point. And that's how the theory goes. And, and I used to be somebody who used to uh, teach this uh, years ago when I was giving my, my uh, professional scrum master classes. This would be how I would explain how to do story points with velocity. And, and, and two or three years ago, I started applying Kanban metric. And, and as I compare my story points to my cycle time, I never get, get this distribution. I get a, another kind of distribution. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like. It looks like this. In 90% of teams that I've had in the last three years, that one point, that two pointer, and even that story, those stories with three points, are all about the same kind of value when we look at it from the cycle time angle. And that distribution here, where my one point is anywhere from zero days all the way to 20 days, it just happens on any scale of two points, three points. And if you look at it for five points, it's also in that same distribution or in that same range of five days all the way, to, all the way up to around 20 days. Even more surprisingly, my eight point stories are also within that 20 days. And, and as I do this from team to team from the last two years, I'm going, hmm, am I getting the right value from those story points? Or is there another way I could use cycle time to uh, help my team better, my customer also, and, and management around my customer who might ask, who might is asking questions about uh, uh, when will uh, our, our stuff be done? And the answer is yes. And it's all thanks to, to people like Jose from the Kanban community who, who are bringing that, that, that way of thinking about, about metrics with Kanban. So let me show you a little bit how I'm, how, now I apply uh, a cycle time. Oh, but right before I show you how, I'm kind of curious to, uh, to poll the, um, uh, the audience about, uh, right now, have you compared uh, uh, your story points for completed items compared to the actual time it took to complete them. I, I'd be kind of interested to know about your uh, the audience if they're actually doing this. So we're almost half and half. We still have around 40 people voting. That's awesome. I haven't bored anyone yet, so that's great. And we're almost at 50%, so a little bit more says no, then yes. And, and nobody says, I don't know. So that's good. That's interesting. So 
50% of the audience is actually not doing this. So that might be something of value that you might want to try when you go back to work tomorrow or this week and see if there's, there's value of doing this right now. And if there's a, a normal distribution between your story points or if they're all packed and jammed in that same distribution like I was showing uh, previously. So what I do now with my cycle time is I'm going to still keep my cycle time on my Y axis here, but my X axis is not going to be story point. It's going to be time or the historical time for all my data in my project. So what I mean is I'm going to plot one story that has been completed, for example, on March 5th, and that story took 12 days to be completed. So I put a dot there, which on March 5th, it says that it's been completed uh, in 12 days. That little bubble here shows us this. And I can also have uh, many stories which are going to be completed on the same day. For example, on February 12th, I might have two items which will be completed. I'll have one story completed in four days. And on the same day, there's going to be something that has been completed, but that time in nine days. So I'm just going to start plotting all of that data on my new chart, which is going to be called a cycle time scatter plot chart. And at the end of the day, when I've charted all of those points, I'm going to get this kind of distribution. That's, that's my distribution and, and you will get your own distribution based on how your team completes their data. Now, where we want to take it one step further is to look at that new y axis on the right which is called the percentile axis and, and percentile is a really scientific word to say let's let's draw some line on that and get some cycle time on it what i mean is i'm going to look at my 50 percent percentile which means the 50 i'm going to draw a line here and i'm going to look at that's going to take 50 percent of all my items on my cycle time scatter plot and it's going to tell me, well, you've got a 50% chance of completing an item in six days or less because 50% of my data is actually underneath that percentile line. So if I've got a customer knocking on my door this afternoon or tomorrow morning and it's going to ask me, Louis, I've got this, this user story here and I'd like to know when will it be done? Well, I've got two options. I can tell him I'm going to do some planning poker and check out the velocity. I can just look at my new chart here that I'm showing to you and say, Mr. Customer, I've got a 50% chance of completing this in six days or less because historically your team completes, has completed 50% of its items in six days or less. And usually when I have that conversation with my customer, uh, they'll go, well, 50%, that's not really a high confidence level. Can you, can you bump it up a little bit? And my answer will be, yeah, for sure, that's, that's, that's reasonable. I can understand why 50% is not enough. So I go there then to 75%. So I go back to my percentile line, and this time I'm going to draw it on the 75% mark, and I'm going to end to nine days. So I can look back at my customer now and tell him, Mr. Customer, you've got a 75% chance of completing this new user story if we start working on it tomorrow it's going to be completed in nine days or less with a 75% confidence level. How do you feel about that? And usually my, my customer will say, mm, that still means that there's a 25% chance that I won't make it or the team won't make it. Can you still bump that up a little bit more? Sure, no problem. I understand that. That's, there, there's still a fair amount of risk. So I'm going to bump it up a little bit more to 85%. So this means that at the 85% line or percentile line, which goes to 12 days, I've got 85% of my data underneath that line. So historically, all of my, my points were completed in 12 days or less, 85% of the time. And at that level, uh, for the last two years, as I've been using those, those Kanban metrics in my teams, all of my customers, all of my product owners have said, this is a good threshold. I'm ready to accept that there's a 15% risk that it won't, it won't happen, but 85%, that's really good for me. So this takes us to a, a new notion or a new definition called the service level expectation in your team, which is the time it should take 
a given item to flow from start to finish within the Scrum team's workflow. And for example, a SLE, a service level expectation, could be in, in your Scrum backlog of eight days or less, 85% of the time. So your service level expectation will always have two parts. It will have a period of elapsed time. So in this case, it's gonna be the eight days or less. And the second part will be a probability of happening. So that is the 85% uh, 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 confidence level or chance that it will happen. So knowing this new fact or this new data, uh, when I'm doing refinement uh, uh, sessions with my teams, I will go and start, I'll, I'll stop using planning poker cards and I'll replace it with the SLE. So instead of asking my team, is this a two point or a three point, let's point this story. We're gonna ask the question, can we do this in eight days or less? If the answer is yes, we take the story and we're, we make it ready for a sprint backlog. If the, if the answer is no, let's have a small conversation of, can we split this in, in two little, little part? Can we take our story and split it in two so that each pieces will still respect our SLE? If the answer is yes, Mr. Customer, we can do these two little things in eight days or less. Great, let's put that uh, to be ready for a sprint backlog. But there might be a little risk that this new piece of, of functionality, this new requirement is just too big because of the complexity of the work, because of the technologies being involved. Uh, maybe the team is gonna say, this is just too big, Mr. Customer, we've got to make it in just one big piece of work and we feel that it's gonna be higher. So we might just wanna tag it or follow it along, but it's not gonna meet that eight days or less. And that's just normal because it's gonna fall in that 15% of the time where it's not gonna be that way. So, so question for the audience before I move along to my second uh, uh, Kanban metric. Um, oh, sorry, just before I just wanna go through the uh, um, uh, advantages of using the SLE. Well, well, for me, it's, it's based on historical data and not estimates anymore. I don't have to have a conversation around, uh, is this a two point or a three point? I still have the conversation around, do we still understand what this requirement is? Let's create that conversation and then that shared understanding. But net, let's not use planning poker as a way to decide of the amount of work through estimates but let's use historical data and see if it goes, this story will go above or under that SLE. So for me, that's a, a great game changer of not using estimates anymore, but historical data. And, and the great thing about this is uh, cycle time will embed delays in an unexpected event. If I've got a team pointing a, a, a five point on a user story, and, and my team is really doing a lot of DevOps work, well, all those, those delays or those outages, well, that five point on a story might be disrupted because of all those unexpected events. So cycle time and SLE will encapsulate this in just one data or one metric. And, and I find this awesome. Finally, uh, I find that the SLE will replace planning poker and we will start talking in days and not in points anymore. I don't know about you guys, but I am a bit tired of always explaining what is a five point to a customer who's from the realm of days and weeks, and he's got translate days and weeks to points. It's always a odd and fuzzy conversation that I have, and it brings a lot of opacity to uh, the work that has to be done. So when we start work talking in days again, thanks to compound metrics, I find just change the conversation also with your customer. Uh, uh, Jose, is there any uh, question that might be of value before we move on to the uh, next Kanban metric? Yes, um, we have had a couple of uh, interesting questions. Let me just uh, quickly ask you one, one that just came recently and then I've been looking for a couple more. Um, what happens if we don't have historical data? Yes, you've got two choices. Uh, the first one is you can just set yourself a SLE. Let's say, sh let's try to shoot for uh, eight days or less, 85% of the time. And, and mathematically, it takes around 12 data points, 12 completed, completed items to have a SLE, which is uh, uh, gonna reflect your data. After uh, 12 data points of completed items, your SLE will be valuable. Mm -hmm. So it might be a really off, but that's just gonna be a reflection of how maybe your team is having some difficulty with the work. 
So you, you basically have two choices. You can pick one and after one sprint or two, uh, reflect and, and spec and adapt to see if it makes sense or just say, we don't know and we'll wait for those 12 points of data and that will, will, will be our baseline for our next SLE. Mm -hmm. We have another question which was, um, in, in your definition of cycle time, where, where does the, the clock start and where does the clock end? Yes, uh, as I was showing uh, previously, I decided for this talk to mm -hmm. say that the clock starts when I put my car and my story in the ready column of the sprint backlog all the way to when it gets done. But, but in your situation, if it starts more in, when it drops into the in development column or any other column, that will be up to you to decide when you start uh, uh, the timer on your story. And that's part of the team's definition of workflow. In the exactly yes exactly okay so one final question and when we we can move on um so uh shane was asking does that's when you we're talking about cycle time and the time it takes to do things does this account for pairing and mobbing in the analysis um do you have a i got a hard time understanding the question is there a little bit more background around it uh, jose uh, no, um, if, if, if I'm reading the question for me, it's like going, connecting to the question before, it would be that it, if your definition of workflow includes pairing and moving, and that's something that you are, is within your, when you're calculating your cycle time, then probably yes. If not, then probably not. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If, if uh, pair programming or mobbing is important to your team, it's a value that you de hold dearly, well, it will have an impact on cycle time. Hopefully, it should, it should lower that, that cycle time as people will be working together. Another key thing maybe to remember is looking at your work in progress. Uh, that's something else that's completely outside of this whole talk, but uh, the work in progress will have a, a direct impact on, on the cycle time also. One final one, because Darren, my good friend, has been cheeky here. Does, <laughs> does cycle time include weekend, weekends? Uh, in, in our definition, in, in the Kanban guide for Scrum teams, and even if I go back to Daniel Vacanti's definition of cycle time, uh, it's the number of elapsed days. So, so yes, we'll include weekends. Uh, uh, from my experience in Canada, uh, I've, I'm meeting more and more teams who are DevOps teams in the sense that uh, they build it, they run it and they deploy and they maintain it. And this means that I've had a lot of teams now who are working during the weekend. So, so th this notion of, of excluding weekends is getting more and more fuzzy for the last couple of years. So for, for me, I, I find cycle time will really be a, a notion of elapsed days and that will include weekends. Another way where I find that uh, elapsed days makes more sense is if I'm December 1st and uh, I've got a customer who's asking me, when will this story be done? And I tell him it's gonna be in 30 days. He's, I have never had a customer who's counting the weekends. He just thinks that December 30th. And, and then it's kind of my responsibility of saying, oh, well, you know, there's some, there's some holidays in there. There's going to be some people taking some, some time off. So it's going to be my kind of responsibility to say, well, because of, of the, all those holidays around the Christmas season, well, that might not be the right answer. So since customers are thinking in, lab, in elapsed days and not, not thinking of, of weekends, I find it's, it makes more sense to stick with elapsed days. Awesome. Um, there are some more questions, but we can leave some of them for later on. Okay, sounds good. So, so I'll, I'll work on, I'll work now on, on work item aging. This is something that I find is awesome because it changes the daily scrum so much. So, uh, um, question to the audience, first of all, how many of you keep track of the age of items, uh, in your work in progress? Oh, good to know. We're still about uh, 40, 50 votes. That, that's awesome. I haven't lost or bored anyone yet. So thank you people for sticking in for, for voting. And it's kind of interesting now to see that our, our, our um, results are a bit different. So we've got around 45% of people are saying yes, they are tracking it. 20% uh, uh, are saying no. And 32% of people are saying, well, we sometimes track it and sometimes not. 
So, so I'd like to take a few minutes to explain how I am tracking uh, work item aging and why I find it's a, a really useful metric for my, my Scrum teams. So I'm going to start with a really simple sprint backlog with the ready column, dev, review, and done. And I'm going to look at my current, current uh, uh, user stories in that sprint backlog. So you can see that I've got one story here, A, which is completed. I've got three of them in the in review column. I've got two in the dev, and I've got three of them which aren't even being worked on. They're still in the ready column. And, and looking at them, it's just, it's my regular sprint backlog, but I'm gonna add a new axis here on the right, on the left, sorry, which is gonna be the age of my items. So items will, which will be lower on that sprint backlog will be younger in the sprint backlog, and items which will be higher up there will be older in the sprint backlog. What I mean by this is if I look at uh, story B, it's been in the sprint backlog for 14 days now. J just to make sure, it's not 14 days in the review column, but since it has started a timer in the ready column, well, user story B is now 14 days in the sprint backlog and it's currently in the review column. Another story I wanna bring your attention on is the story F. So from the moment it started in the ready column, it's been in dev for only now two days. So I'm looking at this from the aging perspective and I am seeing that items in there are, are quite old. For example, G might be around 14 or, or 15 days and it hasn't moved yet. It's still in that ready column. So, so where do I wanna go with that? Well, I'm gonna bring back my SLE that we had a conversation earlier about. So I'm gonna bring that SLE at 85% with 12 days or less. So when I run my scrum, uh, daily scrum meeting every day, I might want to use the age of the items to have a conversation around which item are at risk or going higher than my SLE as they are now uh, uh, may, may, maybe making my bre breaking my promise with my, my customer, which I've told him, you'll have that B, B story here in 12 days or less. And that story is still in review on the 14th day. So at the daily scrum, I might not go with the uh, uh, three questions of what have you been doing yesterday? What are you doing today? And what's blocking you? Instead of just going in a circle with zo like zombies and, and, and answering those questions, I can now change the format, format of that daily scrum and walk the board from right to left and focus only on things which are making them at risk compared to their SLE. So I won't even maybe, I won't even talk about uh, user story F here because it's been only two days in the sprint backlog it's way, way below there. It's not at risk of reaching that SLE of 12 days. So I might not even hit that card during that, that uh, daily scrum. And we might just address another card here, which is G, and asking our customer or our team, why, why did we put that in there? How come G is in there for 15 days? And maybe it's just gonna force us, well, we should maybe review it, or maybe nobody wants to take it. So it's gonna create brand new conversation, I find, uh, when we do the daily scrum. Although if I could give you a piece of advice, I don't do it every day. I find that doing this kind of daily scrum every day kind of annoys everybody because they kind of know, yeah, Louis, we know this is late and we got to do it. But doing it once or twice a week kind of reminds everyone that the age of items and beating the SLE is something of importance for, for the team and for a customer. So, so for me, the advantage of using this second Kanban metric, work item aging, is that once again, it's based on facts, not estimation. In, in my previous years of, of being a Scrum Master, I would ask my teams to uh, uh, split their stories and tasks, estimate the amount of work left, and we would follow a sprint burn down uh, chart. I don't do this with work item aging. I've got the age and it's a fact, it's, it's historical data and not, not an estimation. So it's much more fun to focus on the pace of work and not just estimation. And the third thing, ter third thing which I love is it's gonna change the dynamic of the daily scrum from walking the board from right to left, from asking just questions around things which are around the SLE, maybe above, maybe a little bit just below. Well, it changes those conversation around really the work and not just the three questions. And finally, as I was saying, well, it's focused on work items which are uh, at risk of being late. Um, any other questions, Jose, before I move on to throughput? 
we are having a couple of questions, so I'm trying to keep up. Um, <laughs> so there's a question, for example, um, how does aging fit with planning sessions, sprint planning sessions? Uh, uh, does, this, does the question mention if there's already stuff in the sprint backlog or? Um... No, that's all. Ah, darn. Okay. <laughs> well, at the sprint planning or maybe at the refinement, I, I'm going to try to answer this the best that I can. Uh, when I put new stuff in the sprint backlog, uh, I'm going to use the SLE as my uh, reference point of if it goes underneath, if it's lower than the SLE, I can put it in the sprint backlog compared to if it's if it's higher than the, the SLE, for example, it's 15 days, we feel it's going to be it's going to take 15 days to make this story happen and our, and our SLE is only eight days or less, well, we might not want to put that whole thing in the sprint backlog. So that's how I would use cycle time and SLE at the sprint planning and not really the work item age at sprint planning. Cool. Let me ask another question. Um, someone's saying like, um, I don't know whether it's just restricted to aging or metrics in general, but does this lead to micromanagement? Uh, no, well, maybe in your situation, in my situation, and, and I, I, you're going to steal, I'm going to say, steal my own uh, last line of the conference of, I find that those Kanban metrics help us uh, ask the right questions sooner because they provide a new level of transparency, which story points didn't have because what is one story point? Is it five days? Is it six days? And it's different from team to team. With Kanban metrics, we're always talking about days. And if we're seeing, for example, that throughput is starting to go down, well, we could look at what is the cycle time of the last three weeks. Maybe throughput is going down, but what about cycle time? Maybe cycle time is going up because these are bigger chunks of work that we're doing. It's taking uh, more time to complete, so that makes more sense that our throughput is going down. So, so, so for me, it has been beneficial because I can ask the right questions sooner. It has also removed that kind of, of micromanagement from, from my part. Um, let me ask another question quickly. Um, does estimating in days cause problems like optimism bias and things like that? Um, I, I can't really, I, I, I've never, uh, honestly, with my uh, 17 years of experience, uh, I've never estimated in days. It has always been in story points. And, and yes, when it has been in story points, people had fudged the numbers. Uh, which is, again, something that I find that with store, uh, cycle time and work item aging, it's just harder. It gives you a, a better uh, 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 overview of, of what is going on in your sprint backlog. If I, can I add something as well? For sure, for sure, Jose. Uh, and uh, one thing that I was saying is that um, when we're doing est estimation using flow metrics, typically, for example, cycle time requires work to have been completed. So we're using a statistical analysis, statistical forecasting on work in order to estimate future work. So that it's much, there is less possible bias that we can introduce to it. Um, we just basically um, doing a statistical analysis on our system, on how things work. Um, let me see, because there was a, a question here and then we can move on. I think this is gonna move, oh, I, I, it's a few questions and I almost lost it. Ah, how do you estimate team capacity? How much can a team take on the sprint? Yes, um, I'll, I'll go to do, um, this is a great timing. I'm gonna talk about throughput and I'll fudge a little bit about capacity in there if you don't mind, uh, Jose. Uh, that was the such way, I'll, I'll go silent. <laughs> Sweet, so I'll move on to throughput, my third Kanban metric. Uh, and just before we, I'm, I'm kind of giving it in, uh, of if we don't point anymore with cycle time, SLE, we don't really use points during refinement or sprint planning, which metric should we use? I kind of already gave the answer, but if people just want to vote just to uh, give some data points, uh, that would be appreciated. So we've got, uh, uh, we might just not, don't want to estimate anymore, just you following the uh, no estimate movement. Uh, we could also say that uh, with SAFE, SAFE says, or from the training I had, it's uh, one point equal one day, or we can just stay uh, with hours and, and go back to that time when we uh, use hours instead. 
So most of the answers uh, is around throughput and, and that is also the, the correct answer from, from my point of view. Uh, we're not gonna use any uh, point anymore and, and we use points to create a velocity and we use to forecast with that velocity. If this all falls apart, which other metric should we use? And the answer with, with Kalman metrics is throughput. So last chapter of this talk will be around throughput. So um, let's, let's take this little uh, scenario and I'll try to answer the, the question around capacity. Uh, my team actually work, completes five items per week. And at sprint planning, which is a two week sprint, how many items would you advise your team to take? And in this answer for on menti.com, you can actually type your answer. So it's not, just, it's not just gonna be a few clicks. You can actually type your answer and you'll see it uh, showing up. So thank you for the first person who just answered. 10 uh, would be an answer. It depends. Thank you. I'm guessing that person is probably a consultant. So I'll let a couple of people answer. Six to seven, I've got 10, 7.5. Depend on whether your sprint is one week or two week. It is a two week sprint. Now I'll scroll down a little bit. I've got a lot of five, tens, eight, eight, 12, five, eight for two week sprints, 10 for two week sprints. Awesome. I'll let just a couple of other results coming in. There you go. All right. So, so in theory, the right answer would be 10 items because if they complete five items per week and you've got two week sprints, they could put 10 items in there. And they, that's where all the nuance comes in of if it's really small items and, and your team at refinement are, are, are all saying, well, it's all, it's all, it's, 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 it's a little piece of work. Well, you might want to take a little bit more than 10 items. And on the opposite, if it's big items that you feel that are close to your SLE, well, you might wanna take a little bit less. So I can understand why I'm seeing answers of eight items or, or nine items, that also makes sense. And to the question of the, of the gentleman or the person who also asked, what about capacity? Well, I had a, a colleague at my previous job who used capacity every, every sprint to see if some people were going on vacation, on the holidays, if they were taking some, some paid time off. And he would include that capacity calculation to lower uh, the amount of, of items that they could take, even though they had maybe a throughput of five items per week, knowing that two team members were maybe, maybe taking a week off, well, that would be another uh, variable to take into account uh, before they go into sprint planning and take the right amount of work. So, so to my question, and this is my proposition. If, if, I, is, if I want to plan the next sprint, uh, my proposition with the Kanban metrics would be to use the latest throughput. And, and what I mean by this is I'm going to pull up a, a throughput run chart that you are actually seeing here, uh, created by an awesome tool called Analytics by Actionable Agile. I strongly recommend and suggest that you uh, check out Analytics for uh, seeing your metrics from a Kanban perspective. And this is uh, data from a team that I worked with from April 2018 to the end of 2018 here. And during that part uh, of the year, uh, my team had a throughput around maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 items uh, around April. And it kind of got up, up, up to uh, October of 2018 where they were now doing maybe 20 items per week. Uh, their throughput increased. So when we were doing sprint planning at the end of 2018, uh, we would look at this chart and mostly looking at the latest throughput, uh, not the one in back in April, but the ones in, in October and November. And we would use that throughput as our, our tier, uh, first number to start planning at our sprint planning. And as, as the question was asking about capacity, that's our first indicator of this is how much stuff we, we wanna take. And then thinking about are these small items, big items, do we have the full capacity or do we have people uh, going on holidays? And then using all of those variables to try to pick the right number of items for our sprint planning. 
then it takes us to uh, what do we want to do when we have to forecast delivery dates in, in a few months. Velocity is pretty good, was kind of good for the next sprint to help us plan the right amount of work for the next sprint. And it was also kind of helpful for uh, delivery dates for a few months ahead. So if we're saying goodbye to velocity, what can we do? What other kind of metric or tool can we use to forecast for a couple of months? Well, for my proposition of saying, well, we've got 43 items left in our product backlog to plan for this project. Well, my proposition would be, let's use Monte Carlo simulation as, and as an input of that simulation, we'll use the historical throughput of our team. So for example, my 43 items here are in my product backlog. This is my sprint backlog. And my customer is asking me, Louis, I've got 43 items left. When will those 43 items be done through all my uh, sprint backlog? So through Monte Carlo simulations, I can do this and I'm gonna get some, some forecasting dates uh, like in the ex uh, similar format of, for example, I might say, well, I've got a 90% confidence that in 25 days or, or less, I can deliver those 43 items. And if I look at the results of my Monte Carlo simulations, well, there is a 30% chance of confidence or 30% confidence level that we can do those 43 items in 16 days or less. And since I've been using those simulations for the last two years, uh, most of my customers are always looking at that green number here with a high level of confidence. And they almost never, never look at that uh, number on the far right. They all only focus on that number and try to work with that number. And the beauty out of those simulations, of those Monte Carlo simulations, is that as every week uh, is, is completed, it gives you a new throughput that you can feed those simulations with. And you can see every week or even every day, those numbers change always according to those, to those historical data that you're feeding this simulation. So I find once again that compared to velocity, while well, we're using historical data to get the uh, right numbers. So for a quick, quick recap, what have we talked about for the last maybe 45 minutes? Well, we've talked about Kanban metrics, which are based on historical data and not in estimations. I, I'm sure I've, I've said the word estimations a lot of time. Uh, I think it helps us get away from estimations. So it's a great alternative if you're not getting enough value out of estimations with planning poker, story points, and velocity right now in your team. Uh, I find that it brings more transparency for all. And, and finally, I think it helps us ask the right questions sooner. So, so in conclusion, there's something that I, I really find important when I, I, I want to complete the, this talk is I go back to the uh, Agile Manifesto. And, and before the first line of the Agile Manifesto where it says individuals and collaborations over processes and tool, there's a first line, there's a first sentence in there that I love that says, uh, we are uncovering better ways of developing software and by doing it and helping others do it. And in the last year, I've been, I've, I've been contacting a lot of, of key figures in the agile world of telling them, we've got these awesome Kanban metrics. Can I, can I take 20 minutes of your time to show them to you? Or, or I've seen you give a, a keynote about estimations, how they're, they're not really fun and they're not useful. And, and you haven't talked about Kanban metrics. Can I, can I take 20 minutes of your time to talk about them? And I've been turned down so many times that I, I just don't get it because we're agilists. We're supposed to inspect and adapt and find better ways. And I find that Kanban metrics are a key part of making our profession even better. So, so if, if, if I've kind of maybe touched a soft spot tonight and, and it has uh, caught your interest, I can only recommend that you use the brain approach uh, to try the uh, uh, Kanban metrics. And by brain approach is what are the benefits of using Kanban metrics in your team or in your own work, work environment? Is there any risk uh, of using them right now? Where I am right now, uh, because of the whole uh, situation, not a good time to use Kanban metrics, but as Scrum Masters, we are preparing to do a proposition uh, for later on where I'm working to maybe replace those, uh, those story points with uh, uh, Kanban metrics. Is there any other alternative bes besides maybe story points, velocity, and Kanban metrics? And I find that the other, uh, other alternative is no estimate. So that might be also your alternative to think about. And, and what is your gut feeling? What is your intuition after seeing this talk or reading about combat metrics? What, what do you feel? What is, what is your 
gut feeling about this? And finally, you can just do nothing about all of this. You can just say, well, I'm getting value out of story points and velocity. I'm just not going to touch uh, Kanban metric. It's just not my time right now. So I, I want to thank Jose a lot for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about Kanban metrics for the last 45 minutes. It, it's been my pleasure. And this is an open platform. So you're more than welcome to type in your comments as they'll be scrolling down. I'll try to answer a couple more questions facilitated by Jose. And once again, thank you very much, everybody, for participating tonight. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Jose, do you have, a, is there any questions from participants that I could uh, maybe answer, we could answer? Uh, I'm trying to get a few here. So, so there was a question here. Can you, let me see, just say, can you elaborate a little bit on the quality of backlog items needed to get most out of working with flow metrics in a scrum setting? Okay, can you maybe just repeat the first part of that sentence? Can you elaborate a little bit on the quality needed, I guess, for the backlog items that, that, that you know, how much quality the backlog items must have to get the most out of the metrics. I, I believe it's the same quality as we did before with, with uh, a planning poker in the sense that uh, acceptance criteria, having the right level of definition of shared understanding, uh, that's still part of the conversation in there. I, I find that the planning poker conversation was useless, but the analysis or, or shared understanding on what we have to do and acceptance criteria is quite useful. So I believe that whole analysis part is, is useful and we should keep it that way. But the planning poker part, I would now uh, uh, put that into the Agile Museum. Cool. Um, there was a, an excellent comment by Kathy um, and it's something that usually I would recommend to teams. It's like, if you want to try flow metrics, um, she's saying like run them alongside each other, perhaps other other kind of metrics or story points, and compare, see see how it goes, and, and maybe you know build trust um, with how to use them. Yes, mm. yes, it, it, totally. And, and mm. may I? There's a there's a little comment here, Jose, that I, I really like on on the board. Mm -hmm. Go on. It's mm. there's how do you split PBI so you have even items? Well, mm. well, you don't. This was a revelation when, when I got my first Kanban class. And I, and I can't thank enough people from the Kanban uh, community like uh, uh, Daniel Vacanti, and I'm going to point at Jose again. Uh, it's, it's not a, a question of same sizing, but right sizing. So, so as you are looking at your PBIs, are they uh, above or beneath that service level expectation? So if it's, it's above, you should maybe look at splitting if, if you can split it in two pieces of value. And if not, I would just keep it at that big and, and track it during the sprint backlog. I find that it's, it's not, the onus is not on your product owner of making every PBI even. Uh, we should accept that, that those differences in sizes and use that SLE as our, 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 our barrier, our frontier on what we can split or not. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, Excellent. There was a question about like, is there a free tool that uh, that does Monte Carlo simulation? Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, I use my own little code. Um, after this talk, I, I'm, I'm guessing Jose will maybe give my, my contact info. I can point to you where um, uh, I've got some code on GitHub to run those simulations. Otherwise, uh, the other great tool is analytics from Actionable Agile. I am looking to build one called Pacemaker later on this year after baby is born and I, I've got some free time, but who knows how, how's that gonna work? Sleepless nights. Eh? <clears throat> Another one that has been mentioned a couple of times is uh, Troy McGuinness has a, an Excel-based uh, metrics tool. Um, you, you have to load the data into it and it will do a lot of this stuff as well. Um, but uh, yeah, action or agile, a few tools do this. Uh, what else, any other question? Uh, I'm not seeing, I'm trying to catch up with the chat is moving really quickly. Um, there was a question about how many data points to do Monte Carlo to do throughput metrics. How many data points do we need? Uh, from my understanding, it's 12 data points in theory. I don't know, Jose, if that's mm. a good number for you or you, do you bump it up a little bit more? No, it's the same. Um, uh, uh, but instead of, what I will, because we're using throughput, instead of 12 backlog items, it would probably be 12 days worth of data. 
makes sense. Thanks. It's still just 12 data points. Um, so there's a question about, oh, I just saw one here about like whether items could go back in the workflow and what happens with the metrics then? Yeah, it, it does. It does make uh, or skews the metric, if I could say, if it goes back. So, so we'll try to avoid this and, and have more of a conversation on why do we have to take it back. So mm -hmm. yes, it does disrupt a little bit the, uh, uh, the metrics. From, from my perspective, it does, but we try to do it. It's, it's not the norm. It's more of the exception than the norm. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. What's your advice, Jose, on, on taking stuff um, back? This is a big... Um big long conversation uh, I tend to not want to get any work item going back um, you lose a lot of very relevant information when you do that and mm. many times we, we 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 do that for the wrong reasons so especially when 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 the, you have a, a, a ticket a work item that has gone for example into a testing phase and in its development and you move it back to development that's actually not that's breaking workflow rules in some ways. This yes. it becomes problematic. Um, there was a question that I just saw. Uh, and someone mentioned as well, Matthias Batistone, who's a good friend of us as well, uh, has some spreadsheets available too with, with metrics. And he has a metrics book as well. Um, Dan just uh, wanted to tell Dan Brown of um, wanted to tell you that his um, his kids are 17 and 16 years old, and he's still waiting for that first time free time to do the programming. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know what you put in. Um, there was a, there was a question about like what about blocked items? Uh, do they do we use the block time in our metrics? Uh, well, well, I'm going to use the block uh, uh, flag or type to uh, maybe uh, uh, articulate or facilitate my my daily scrum a little bit differently from day to day. Uh, uh, but it's just there to have a visual signal for me of oh, there's something being blocked, and maybe have some policies of maybe after. 10, 15 days, if it's still blocked, should we just then remove it off the wall or off the board because that 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 thing is not a, a pressing matter anymore? Good. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so it's about going backwards. Maybe um, Sylvia is saying like, wouldn't um, Tickets going backwards, uh, wouldn't that be reflecting what's happening in real life? And um, we need to look at how the team is actually working together. Yeah, that, for, for me, Jose, that's a valid point. I, I would try to expose that in a retro or just a small conversation and try to figure out, is our workflow well-defined, for example, or, or how come it's always bouncing back and forth and try to clear that one up. Maybe something is just not clear in the way that we are working. So I would see that as an opportunity to learn and why we're not doing it. So to get it straight in and out, if we could, if I could say. Yeah. What well, one one um, I say anti pattern that we see in this is that imagine that you have a work item that needs work development work, moving that work item to the development column. If you have that. It's a sign of to me. It's a sign of resource thinking of silo work. Um, and stuff like that. The workflow is supposed to reflect what happens to the work, not the roles that people have. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, for example, in PSK, in Scrum with Kanban, that we we told, we, we suggest to people is uh, that the workflow definition does not match the job titles of people. Um, the, uh, Dan Vacanti has an excellent example of a team that use um, all sorts of like Harry Potter name for the columns. Um, just to break that mental pattern that in its development, we move the ticker to the development column. That, that's, that's not flow management, that's almost resource management. Yes, and I can remember, <laughs> I, I remember a team who used planets to name their column and one of them was Uranus. Nobody wanted to be the, uh, work, put <laughs> stuff in the Uranus uh, column. Yes. I'll let you I had, know why. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a team in Cancun I was working with that they had chili names, different chilies. So see which one was the spiciest. <laughs> Yes, uh, great comment by Martin Hopaka there, like uh, manage the work, not the workers. So that's good. Um, uh, Andres, you had a question about like whether do you, we use uh, quality metrics, other quality metrics like the number of defects produced and, and things like that. Uh, yeah, that would be maybe just a whole talk all to itself. But yes, mm -hmm. that's I find that's another part of, of metrics in, in the DevOps slash uh, software engineering 
part of our profession, yes, that these are totally valid also to add to the metrics. These are mostly, I find, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, productivity metric. I can't find a really better word, but it shows a flow of work. And I find that teams like seeing that they are getting more productive. And those metrics are, are telling a better story, I find, than, than story points and velocity. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, and um, so um, Ivan has just shared both your, um, uh, your GitHub um, account and Matthias Batiston's account. So it's on the, they're on the chat right now. Thank you. Um, I think, well, maybe there's a question here. Uh, what do you think about cumulative flow charts? Cumulative uh flow. Yes, yes, they're, they're a great tool uh, for retrospective, for example, in, with your scrum team of looking at how your system is behaving and asking, again, uh, good questions about what is your actual work in progress, knowing that limiting your whip will uh, usually put your cycle time uh, shorter. Well, it, it's a great tool, I find. It's one of the great tools that the Kanban metrics is bringing to the uh, scrum com community. So I'm, I'm all for it. Cool. And then the uh, question here, how do you just throughput with the team's members changing availability per sprint? Yes, and I love that question, Jose, because mm -hmm. uh, I find it's, it's again, it's, it's a great metric to ask the right question sooner. I, and I had that situation where I had a manager moving around his people and that throughput metric was always going down and back up and then back down because he was moving people. And, and that, that chart, that throughput run chart, showed him as the impact of him moving people around had an impact on, on that throughput. So it's, it's, I find it's a good way to have a conversation with management of, well, if you stabilize your team, your throughput would actually go up. And that's a very important thing. In order to do statistical forecasting, uh, there is an element that you need to have a system of some sort of a stability in your environment. And if your, your, your data is going to be as reliable as, as, as it reflects reality. Exactly. So. Yes. Good. Um, I don't see any more questions right now. I don't know whether in the, in the comments on uh, Menti there are uh, any, but otherwise we are almost running to the time box. Here you have a question. Planning poker. I saw one on the right, maybe. Uh, Plant Poker generates the right conversation to build a shared understanding. How do your team build a shared understanding? Uh, we Okay, yep. Yeah. To the person who asked the question on the Planning Poker in the comments, uh, what I use is the service level expectation instead of the Planning Poker. So the shared understanding is still there during Splint planning or refinement to understand the customer needs, but we'll use historical data through the service level expectation instead of planning poker slash estimation conversation. And, and just for fun, for people who are still listening, how many hours per week are you spending at arguing if it's a two or a three or a one? Maybe it's just one hour, but if you are five developers per week doing that hour, that's five hours per week that you can kind of remove and give it back to your customer to create value. And the, and the conversation does not require planning poker in itself, does it? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the basic question, I, this, this one, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Lunar Logic poker, planning poker cards. Um, basically, they, they are not politically correct, but they basically is, does it fit in the sprint? Does it not, do we believe it fits in the sprint? Do we believe it's too big? We don't understand it enough. That's basically the conversation that we want to have as a team. Do we think we can do it? Do we think it's too big? We can't. Do we know enough? Um, it, uses, it uses a lot of F words. Which is a, <laughs> let's, let's take lunar, lunar logic. There you are. Shane knows them. T, TFB and NFC. Okay, yeah, I can imagine the uh, Fs in there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, awesome. Um, we it's uh, eight o'clock in in the UK. Um, we don't know whether um, Louis has a very quick. We have to see how quickly you need to go to hospital soon. So I would just like to say thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, we picked at seventy three people during the session. We're still like over fifty of you here. Um, thank you again. Um, we will be announcing two more talks. One is next week. Um, 
taking the opportunity that we are all virtual and we are we are all remote um we're going to get um, um someone from finland this time and we're going to be talking about empathy at work and how we get empathy um helps us to build super um not super highly um high performance teams um uh, sounds like an excellent talk next week um it will be on the meetup website in pro hopefully tomorrow morning um and also today we have announced unfortunately in april we we had to cancel our lineage london conference um but today we we announced that we are going to have our lean agile global virtual conference on the 23rd 24th of july it's going to be a virtual conference and the way we are trained to design it is that it's not going to be um, just a zoom fast and zoom after zoom we want to the way we are going to be designing it is hopefully is to retain all the excellent the things that make us go to conferences so the the water cooler conversations the coffee breaks the interaction with other people's so um I we will be announcing it as well on the on the meta group in the next couple of days we'll put a link to the website but the uh, 23rd 24th of july we will have a um, we will have a, an awesome virtual conference um someone's asking whether there will be free food maybe just maybe and i leave it there so thank you very much everyone uh, the session has been recorded assuming everything is okay with it um, it will be available um, via the Meta Group and uh, our YouTube channel um, as soon as we can process it. But yeah, hopefully, just a few days. Um, Louis, again, thank you very much for your time today. That was great, and thank you everyone for joining us again. And we'll see you soon. All right, bye, bye. Jose. Bye, everyone.